um, Siona Gad, Jaquita Shea Johnson, Dagwa Do. Uh, my name is Jaquita Shea Johnson. I'm an assistant professor of English and digital storytelling. And it is my great privilege to um, welcome our guest speaker, Shelby Nahorlet Meisner. Uh, before we get going, let me go ahead and offer a really brief land acknowledgement um, before I give a real introduction to Shelby and we uh, get started with her talk. We gather here on the colonially occupied territory, which was the ancestral and shared landscape and water system to the Bajaje, Osage, Osheti, Sakawin, uh, the great, the seven fire councils known as the Great Sioux Nation, Athakawa, Meskwaki, Sakon Fox, Kikapoa, uh, Kikapu, Chickasha, or the Chickasha, uh, Niwachu, or the Missouri, Jiwer, Oto, Buxoje, the Iowa, and Guapa, Quapa peoples, as well as the Peoria, Kaskaskia, and Cahokia peoples of the Yelini Confederation and the ancient cultures of the Folsom, Hopewell, and Clovis people. During forced removals and relocations, my tribal nation, Cherokee, along with Delaware, Shawnee, and many other folks traveled through this region, once a significant indigenous contact zone, as evidenced by our close proximity to the Cahokia mound sites near present-day St. Louis, um, no federally tr recognized tribal nations remain in the imposed borders of this land base um, that we call Missouri, though many tribes are represented through the peoples of this area. Um, and it is our responsibility in, as um, people who live and work in this region and in this land grant institution to build structures of support for indigenous students, faculty, and knowledge construction. So with that, um, with that acknowledgement in mind, I'm going to go ahead and welcome our guest speaker, Shelby Nahuelet Meisner, is a Luceno Cupeno Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Georgetown University. Um, her areas of expertise are American Indian and Indigenous philosophy, feminist and non-Western epistemology, and philosophy of language. Meisner teaches and writes about Indigenous knowledge and language systems specifically how those systems relate to land, sovereignty, resistance, memory, feminism, intergenerational knowledge transmission, critical social work, and coalition building. And with that in mind, it is my great honor and privilege to welcome my friend and colleague, Shelby Nahuat Meisner. Thank you. Thank you, Jaquita. Jaquita and I went to grad school together. So seeing Jaquita on the screen for the first time in a long time is filling my heart up with joy, as is seeing all these names. I'm a host, so I can see everybody logging in. Um, and I see so many friends and so many beautiful names. Uh, even if I don't recognize uh, the name, I recognize the last name. So very cool and welcome. Hi everyone, I have just introduced myself in my ancestral language, which is called Luiseño um, or Chamtela. We'll talk about that more uh, in a minute. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I am on the uh, colonially occupied ancestral territory of the Piscataway, Anacostian, and Pamunkey peoples. Um, I'm also like to acknowledge that we are zooming, meaning that the colonial like, occupied and ancestral contemporary territories of those spaces where lithium mining is existing, extractive industries are existing, copper strip mining, electrical grids, all of those are parts of land that are affected by and used by this form of technology and communication. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all the ancestors I bring with me, the ancestors I'll be invoking in this particular talk. I do want to give a small content warning for folks uh, from different tribal backgrounds that I will be showing some images of people who have passed away, as well as playing um, playing a sound bit of somebody speaking who has passed away. Um, I'd also just like to give a general content warning that I will be talking about epistemicide, linguicide, um, and other forms of violence against indigenous communities. So that being said, this talk is more show and tell than it is anything else because that's just where my energy is at this time of the year, especially during Native American Heritage Month. It's a it's a busy month for Native people, um, a lot of a lot of different kinds of flavor. Um, so it's it's really more show and tell than it is anything else. Um, and if you think about it, show and tell is a really really beautiful game that I wish we actually did more of. Um, I'm teaching a grad seminar right now on archives and archival methods. Um, and it seems like show and tell is actually one of our very first opportunities as youth to like show our own personal archives and even include metadata in the telling part. Um, so show and tell is, is praxis. <laughs> 
Um, so today I'm going to show and tell a little bit um, from archives. These are archives of my personal archives, my family archives. These are archives, snippets of archives that I've taken, many of which are housed in UC Berkeley, some of which are housed um, in other sorts of colonial archives, all of which pertain to California Indians, indigenous communities in Southern California. Um, I think a lot of Native people can, can resonate with the idea of, of our family archives and of being um, archivists. We are highly documented people. The churches, the US government, the roles and censuses, censuses that have been documenting our births, baptisms, deaths, burials, name changes, land transfers since the very dawn of colonization. In so many ways, showing up and renaming, writing down a new name for something that already has a name in its own language is colonization 101 because Native people have been documented as long as colonizers have been observing us, we are uniquely aware of the power of an archive. The settler colonial nation state can create and maintain a narrative of our disappearance, and because of their epistemic authority, it is taken to be fact consecrated in the American imaginary, such that many of us take on the role of being ghosts. It might sound silly, uh, and myself, I didn't actually ex wholly experience this until I had left my own home and ventured into places where the American mythology is so strong, where the belief in discovery and conquest and disappearance is so ingrained in the curricula that my very existence is a logical mistake, a category mistake. How could you be an Indian? They say they don't exist anymore. This logically entails that you must be a ghost. While it might sound cool to be a ghost, uh, especially if you're a badly aging goth kid from the 90s like I am, um, it's actually a terrible experience to be a ghost. Uh, the stakes of being written out of history are enormous. So many communities in California where my family is from, as well as on the East Coast here where I live and teach, they're fighting tooth and nail to jump through hoops on the, of the federal recognition process. Even though the US federal and state governments tried to systematically eradicate our lives and cultures, which, by the way, I'd like to draw some attention to the proclamation of Indigenous Peoples Day offered by President Biden. We see there in the writing an acknowledgement of culpability from the federal government in these assimilative practices. So it's no longer radical, I guess, to claim that there was federal attempted uh, cultural genocide, as they call it. So even though the US government and state governments have been systematically participating in this erasure through things like boarding schools, land theft, allotment, and active genocide, we also see this erasure from the historical narrative. Um, we're included in some of these historical narratives, sometimes as merciless Indian savages, um, relegated to the past and written into the moral fabric of American identity that indigeneity is something that can disappear over time, be slowly bled out until there is nothing left. Even though all of that concerted effort was dedicated toward erasing us from the archive, it's still a requirement that indigenous communities in many circumstances prove that they exist using American archives and archival methods. Uh, we have to use an archive that we are not in to prove that we exist. Um, thankfully, indigenous communities have kept our own receipts. Oh, there we go. I've argued in some places that all indigenous people are archivists. So many of our aunties are story keepers, whether those stories are gossip or plant medicine or both, those are sacred stories of our continued resistance that don't exist in official records. Many of our uncles have genealogies and family trees that can fill up a whole room. My uncle literally has a genealogy that fills up an entire room. Um, some communities have official or unofficial designated historians, librarians, and genealogists who spend their entire lives collecting records and remembering stories so the whole community has a reference point and a foothold in an alternative archive to the one that would have us disappear. I was just revisiting um, a piece by beloved philosopher Charles Mills, Creator Rest His Soul, he recently walked on, um, and he writes about the Tulsa race massacre and the resistant memories of Black communities in a similar way that we're thinking about Indigenous archives here. Here's the quote. It says, the memory of the 1921 Tulsa race riot, the worst American race riot of the 20th century, with a possible death toll of 300 people, was kept alive for decades in the Black community long after whites had erased it from the official record. Ed Wheeler, a white research, researcher trying in 1970 to locate documentation on the riot, found that the official Tulsa records had mysteriously vanished and he was only able with great difficulty to persuade black survivors to come forward with their photographs of the event. Here's a quote from Hirsch. 
The Blacks allowed Wheeler to take the picture only if he promised not to reveal their names, and they all spoke only on the condition of anonymity. Though 50 years had passed, they still feared retribution if they spoke out. Here, this quote is meant to show that there is a, an official record, a, an official sort of state archive that's subject oftentimes to state editing, um, as well as these resistant forms of archives kept in communities of particular events. Keeping these resistant archives, keeping receipts, I want to frame this as a trauma response. Working from the assumption that something is going, that someone is going to lie about our existence or write our pain and suffering out of the record is a terrible place to work from. These kinds of archives are made under duress. To complicate this picture a little bit, I want to tell you about Gertrude and Isabel, who are my great 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 auntie and my great great grandma. I think a really simple version of colonial ontology. Um, is that there is an official state record, um, state archives that tell some kind of nationalistic mythology, um, and there are these resistant or clandestine archives kept by communities who know they are not being represented well, accurately, or at all by colonial archives. This picture is accurate in some cases, but it's also a vast oversimplification in others. Um, so I've kind of I've complicated the picture by drawing this wiggly line, this technical wiggly line. Um, Sometimes we see glimmers of resistance inside of colonial archives, places where informants plan to seed, practice refusal, tell a lie, or make a joke. And because these informants are positioned in an incommensurate epi epistemic community, the researcher often doesn't realize that this has been captured in the data, and it is often unintentionally passed along into future generations. So instead of this simple picture of colonial archive and resistant archive, sometimes they're entwined or enmeshed with one another. And I live to find these glimmers of resistance inside of colonial archives. There's so many amazing examples of these. One of my favorite ones is in a um, Hollywood film back when back when any random native person was off, I was asked to play a native person. And these would have these very, very pan indigenous sort of costumes. Um, and then they would say to the actors, you know, say something, say something that sounds Indian, so, say something that sounds native. And we see in several different instances where these actors who are native people <laughs> speak in their language and will say things like these you know, these white directors have no idea what we're saying in their language. It gets captured in this song and then passed on into generations so that now young language activists, people who are studying their languages can watch these old films and hear these moments of resistance inside of this film that was meant to depict indigenous people in this sort of stereotype or caricature, these glimmers of resistance captured inside of a colonial archive. Um, it takes very, very careful reading to see those sorts of glimmering, and we'll um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So, in order, or so, one of the reasons I think I live for these sort of glimmery uh, moments in the colonial archives is because of my ancestors Gertrude and Isabel. They've left me with a lot of questions um, over the years, and in order to offer a way to read the archive as this act of caretaking and to highlight some of the tools to do so, I'm going to zoom in on Gertrude and Isabel's story. Um, and unfortunately for you, <laughs> that means I'm going to read a poem. Um, some notes about the poem before I start reading it is one, I wrote it in grad school when I was like a baby grad student, like probably even before I knew Jaquita or right when I had first met Jaquita. So be gentle and not critiquing too much because I was a baby. Um, and two, I wrote it about a set of recordings that I have had in my family for a long time that was found actually in a storage unit of my great grandmother that my mom happened to be going through after she passed away. She found this set of cassettes. Um, and I, at this point, didn't even know how to play a cassette or what a cassette was. Um, so we had it digitized into a CD, which I'm not even sure we could play now if I wanted to. Um, as media changes, we have to transport our archives in all kinds of different ways, which also leaves uh, imprints on the archives. Um, so this set of recordings, all I really knew about it at the time was that it was my great, great, great auntie, Gertrude Chore, and my great, great grandma, Isabel, talking back and forth. Um, they're being interviewed by someone, and it's quite clear that it's part of some larger archive. And at the time, that's all I really knew about the about the um, recording. I probably listened to it more than a thousand times at this point. Also about the poem, there's a recurring line throughout the poem that is from a lullaby in our language. You'll see it. 
And I've cut it up into little pieces. So each stanza is on a different slide. So you can read along if you'd like. It's called Great Great Grandmother Tongue. I have a fortunate set of recordings from the late 60s of my great 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 auntie Gertrude Chore speaking and singing in Luceno, a tafum pontela, chamtela, to a white linguist. In the recordings, my great great grandma Isabel chimes in once in a while. I imagine the white linguist at his tape recorder playing and pausing my family from existence. His kind flocked to Southern California to pick the bones of our language. Two Indian sisters and a rude white linguist are in the house. Quila wachak, quila wachak, kinga, kinga, kinga. The black oak trees are standing, the black oak trees are standing in the house, house, house. Isabel mentions how sad she is that she doesn't speak as much of the language as her sister, but she tries her best to converse anyway, oftentimes code switching from English to Spanish to Indian to Spanish to English. Her code switching is met with her sister's derision, but they both laugh and are both angry that there's no real Indian word for cat. We use the word gato. Spanish, English, and Indian are in the house. Quila wachak, quila wachak, kinga, kinga, kinga. The black oak trees are standing. The black oak trees are standing in the house, house, house. I listen to the whole recording, 45 precious minutes every few weeks as I've been taking my language classes. Each time I listen, I catch more and more words, and I begin to know my great-great-grandma, who I never met, and her scratchy, deep voice, the now predictable mishmash of her languages. I realize when I hear her that Luiseño isn't really just one language, it's several languages, adapted, ever-changing, resting now temporarily. It's the island languages borrowed from our well-traveled cousins, it's Nawa exchanged up and down the coast. It's Capeño to the south, Cahuilla to the east, and Bribri all the way in Costa Rica. Sometimes when I listen to the recording, I feel like I'm sitting in how I imagine that room, the three of us plus one annoying white linguist, but really a pair of aging giddy sisters and me swimming in the sound of the language, hearing in it the land called California and her people and their stories. Gertrude, Isabel, and Shelby are in the house. Quila wachak, quila wachak, kinga, kinga, kinga. The black oak trees are standing. The black oak trees are standing in the house, house, house. I can tell more and more every time I hear them that the language is really more like a mockingbird of Southern California mockingbirds. It mimics the black oak acorn trees rustling in the hot mountain wind the hummingbirds flitting, the cars zooming down Mount Palomar. It's the trickle of the river, the patter of fart forced marching from Warner Springs, families laughing on porches and the reservations. It's children splashing around in the lake and telling stories about how Monkey Island got its name. It's Lake Henshaw drying up, it's earthquakes and dams and deadly wildfires. It's Spanish reluctantly, English too, it's woven of many mother and stepmother tongues and all three of us are fluent. Quila wachak, quila wachak, kinga, kinga, kinga. The black oak trees are standing. The black oak trees are standing in the house, house, house. So this is, this is my poem that I wrote as a youth, <laughs> trying to unpack some of these very, very complicated experiences of inheriting um, this kind of disembodied uh, archive, and then trying to fill in all the pieces myself. You can see, um, if anybody happens to be from Southern California, you can see the little pieces of the story that just come from things, you know, my cousins say, or my grandpa says, trying to fit them into my understanding of who these people were, who these ancestors were, what the situations were in which they made the decisions to speak to this linguist, the things that they chose to say to him, the things that they chose not to say to him all of these, um, really this kind of longing to take care of those ancestors, this longing to fill in the pieces, really made me feel like I was trying to get into the heads of the people in the space and imagine where they were. And you know, when you're listening to a disembodied set of recordings, like there's all kinds of images that go through your head. And in mine, I was always imagining that the, the Auntie Gertrude and Isabel were sitting in a, in, I, what I imagine is like a couch from the 70s, even though it was in the 60s, with like some kind of Afghan rug behind them and like 
a coffee table, and then this linguist who, for some reason in my mental picture, was like in and out, in and out of the room. Um, I think this because it's 45 minutes of recording, but one of the, or one or two of the recordings are Gertrude taking the recording device and saying, Mr. What's his name isn't here right now. So I'm going to tell you about whatever it is that she wants to tell us about. And so it's so interesting as I'm sitting there listening to that. I feel like I'm the you she's talking to. She's saying, Mr. What's his name's not here. So shall we, this is my opportunity to tell you about all the greens that we ever cooked. Um, you really just form this relationship, uh, filling in the pieces of these sorts of um, archival remnants that we end up with. Um, so of course, my myself and my family became pretty obsessed with these particular recordings, trying to kind of piece them together. And as I was learning my language, I started to understand more and more of what they were talking about. Um, and so at some point, I think I was in grad school, we found this book <laughs> that was written by the person we found out was the person who was the linguist recording my family. Um, this book is very strange. I can't necessarily endorse it nor not endorse it. It's, a, it's worth reading, especially if you have connections to Southern California. Um, and the story is about a fictional linguist who goes to this indigenous community and and you know is recording the language is is asking um, is asking this particular elder based on Gertrude Chore like we can see in the dedication that it's dedicated to uh, Gertrude Chore based on Gertrude Chore um, he's having her teach him the language and he's recording it Malako the 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 actual author of this book is French and the fictional linguist in the book is German. So there's a little bit of artistic license in what's happening in the book. But for the most part, myself and my family read it as, as kind of a fictionalized historical account of his own linguistic methodology, of his own relationship with these communities. Um, I think as a generous read, we see in this book that, that he very much enjoyed and respected and loved the community that he was working with. But there's also some very strange stuff in there. Like he falls in love with uh, the informant's daughter. And so you can see the title of the book a Native American, her man and her roots. So there you go, take that for what it is. Uh, it's an interesting book. So again, this was another kind of piece of, even though it's a fictional account of maybe something that happened in real life, it becomes this piece of this memory that my family is trying to put together of who our family is, what their relationships were with the language and what their relationships were with the, with the researchers who were trying to learn about these languages. Um, and I wanted to play for you a little snippet of um, the recordings, you can hear it, um, and also because there's some really interesting stuff going on philosophically in this really small segment of what Gertrude says. So I'm going to exit out of this and play a snippet for you. What about the uh, what about that song, uh, uh, the sad song? Oh, that, that that's kind of funny song. That's somebody's song. I don't know. Uh, I guess this won't be heard for a long time. By that time, these people that are living will be dead. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a shall it's I say our song? Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll keep it. We won't do it. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Until uh, you know later sure. on. Uh, that's a uh, song. I'm going to play it one more time just so you really get the feel for what's happening there in that little moment. Remember, it takes very careful reading to see moments of resistance in colonial archives. What about the uh, what about that song, uh, uh, the sad song? Oh, that, that's kind of funny song. Is that somebody's song? I don't know. Uh, I guess this won't be heard for a long time, but that time these people that are living will be dead. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, shall it's I say our song? Yes. Oh, well, we'll keep it. We won't do it. Yes. Uh -huh. Until, uh, you know, later sure. on. Uh, that's a uh, song. Oops. There we go. All right. So now that you've heard the recording, I have to point out a few adorable things. First of all, that sound that Gertrude makes when she goes, oh, that's their, you know, oh, that's a sad song. That sound is the sound I think every single family member I have makes. So it's really, you know, 
that's that sound that oh, I don't know. I just I can hear my mom. I can hear my great grandma. I can hear so many people. Um, and then at one point you can hear her. You can hear Gertrude saying to Malico, she's saying, um, that's a sad song. I don't know about sharing this song. Um, that's somebody's song. And then he says, oh, well, we won't do anything with it. We're not going to do anything with it. And then you hear Isabel come in and Isabel says, but that's their song. Um, and she says, well, you know, this won't be heard for a really long time. And, and Malico says, we're going to keep it. Um, and she says, okay, well, you know, nobody's going to hear this forever. And by the time they hear it, we'll all be dead. Um, which is eerie that she says that as we're listening to this at long after they've all passed away. You can hear in that exchange, I think if you're familiar with the knowledge exchange protocols um, of Southern California communities, as well as a lot of other indigenous communities, um, a lot of our songs and stories, even basket weaving patterns belong to particular families, to particular clans, to particular you know, kinship groups. Um, and it's not it's against certain protocols to share those songs if you're not part of that community. So there's this interesting moment of like negotiating epistemic sovereignty. And I don't think of these sorts of protocols as like mere etiquette. It's not like, it's not like a, like a, oh, you, you know, stole my idea and put it in your paper. It's not even an issue of, of citational practice. It's much bigger. It's this sort of epistemic sovereignty. These are songs and stories and narrations of a different group of people to whom I do not have the authority to share this. Um, but you can see that Gertrude is kind of weighing that as she's as she's interviewing with this with Malico. She's saying, you know, I don't want to say this. It's not my song. And then Isabel seems to come in very insistently saying that's someone else's song. You can't be sharing that. Um, and then Gertrude finally decides, OK, I'm going to share it with you, but only because I will not be alive by the time somebody comes to check, you know, comes to get the receipts on who shared this song. And these moments like this one, like obviously that was what, like five seconds of the recording. And there's so much just in that little piece of the decision-making process, the ethical decision-making process with respect to epistemic sovereignty that our ancestors are making when they're trying to decide what to share and what to not share. I think that a lot of us, especially those of us trained in archival theory, especially those of us trained in, in decolonial theory, um, indigenous studies, think a lot about refusal as this option of saying, nope, I'm not going to talk to that person. I don't want to share anything with them. I don't have to share anything with them. And I respect the crap out of that orientation. I myself feel that a lot, even during Native American Heritage Month. Um, but I also see in the particular manifestations we see with Gertrude and Isabel, we see that there's some kind of pressure for them that they want to share this. They're very anxious in other recordings as well as in other spaces that they've been informants. They're very anxious about whether or not the language is going to get passed down to another generation. They spend a lot of time and energy putting together workbooks, um, putting together uh, everything from word searches. Uh, her brother, Jim Martinez, was, was put together a whole book of like little kid language activities uh, where one of the words in the glossary is bell bottoms. Like they were trying really hard to connect and make this language pass on to the next generation because they were very, very anxious about whether or not it would. I think that that sort of pressure is exactly why Gertrude goes into this moment of uncertainty about what, how do we change protocols in a way that protects our knowledge, but also gets our knowledge to another generation um, when we're worried that it might not um, end up there. Um, so that's one example of how I'm seeing this. Oh, hang on, I wanna go back because that's spoiler. Okay, so I spent my whole dang life listening to these recordings, reading this weird book, you know, really, really trying to imagine what was going on here. And as I went through grad school, I ended up like developing this very, very intense sense of, of resentment and anger at archivists, especially, especially archivists in the UC system where there had been this long history of salvage anthropology where indigenous communities were literally descended upon by by anthropologists, by linguists, just like Malico, so that they could, for academic fame and fortune, you know, pick the bones. And I mean that figuratively, and I mean that literally. The UC system still has so many of our ancestors, and they're still in so many pending litigations about the repatriation of those ancestors to us. Um, sorry, I won't go on a tangent <laughs> about, about how angry I am about those things, but I 
I ended up developing this anger and this resentment toward archives, toward archivists. So much of my early work was, was you know, shaking my fist at the sky and at the settler colonial systems that had hoarded our knowledge in this way. Um, and I think I kind of forgot that there is this new generation of archivists. There is this new generation of, of anthropologists. There is a new generation of linguists, many of whom are indigenous and many of whom are holding their colleagues accountable. Um, so as I started learning that kind of in my own life stage transition, a beautiful thing happened where a, an, a language archivist from UC Berkeley randomly found me and said, hey, I have a picture of Gertrude and Isabel doing the recordings of Malico. And remember, this is the image I'd been imagining my whole you know, life. Where, what did it look like? What did they, you know, what did they, how did they dress? How were they positioned? Um, and he sent me this picture. Um, which is so beautiful. This is um, on the left is Gertrude in the middle is Malico, who is more handsome than I kind of imagined him. And then um, Gertrude over here, Isabel Malico Gertrude. And then you can see in this picture, I mean, when I originally found this picture, I was describing it as a picture that I could smell because I know exactly where this picture is taken. I know exactly how that how that area of, of the La Jolla reservation smells during different seasons um, is such a beautiful picture to see where they were. I um, mean, it was really this moment where I was like, look, there are people who are working in these archives who desperately do want to get these back to the communities that they were taken from. Um, and so as I'm embarking on this like more gentle, more transformative era of my own life, um, this is kind of how my engagement with archives has been shifting um, over, over the years. So that was really an opportunity to kind of zoom in on these, on the, the positionality, the actual agency of the people who are making these recordings and making these difficult decisions to collaborate with um, archivists and linguists. Um, so one of the things I wanted to kind of turn to now, I don't know why I formatted it like this, sorry, is a toolbox. This is really like, I'm a philosopher, so I'm really into like, conceptual tools that you can use for all kinds of different things. So this is my toolbox. Um, remember what I'm really interested in is thinking of engaging with archives as a form of caretaking, as a form of, you know, that longing you have to give a voice to your ancestor or fill in the pieces um, of what had happened to our ancestors um, to combine these resistant narratives and these colonial narratives and look for the glimmers of resistance inside of colonial narratives. So I wanna think of that as a caretaking. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that positionality might affect that caretaking. But one way I'm really interested in in this particular case is centering the epistemic authority of the quote documented, of the people who are being interviewed. I think that if somebody had a, a kind of caricatured understanding of who Gertrude is, might actually not catch that small part of the recording where you see her negotiating, you know, a thousands of year long ethical protocol with you know the contemporary conditions of, of linguicide. She's you know negotiating that and that might have been missed by somebody who wasn't centering the fact that she as an epistemic authority is making decisions about how we change epistemic protocols. Um, so some of the tools I wanna like offer, let's just kind of put them out there are these uh, conceptual tools to kind of start centering epistemic authority of the documented. Some of those are attention to um, trickster hermeneutics and epistemic sovereignty. Trickster hermeneutics comes from Gerald Bisner and it is the best phrase. I try to include it in every single talk and paper that I do because it's just such an amazing thing. You know, say it to yourself, trickster hermeneutics, um, as well as epistemic sovereignty. And these are pretty big topics, so I'm going to actually show you the definitions before I move on to protocols and safekeeping. Um, so here, Gerald Visner said, he calls the practices of dominant logics of Western epistemologies manifest manners in his 1994 book, uh, noting that Western epistemologies can only produce mere simulation of Indian identities. These simulations, likened to plastic tomahawks and dollar store chicken feather regalia, are not real or accurate representations of indigenous communities, though they are made salient by settler society's consistent circulation of these images. Here I think of like the cigar shop, like wooden, like native guy. These are circulated, they have traction and cultural capital, even though like we don't actually know very much about who those uh, caricatures are made of, though that's a very interesting ongoing research project. 
Um, so because settlers discursive practices pre-construct indigenous people's identities, settlers are epistemically beholden to these mere simulations of indigenous peoples. Um, manifest manners or settler logics create simulations that real life indigenous people must navigate in their daily lives. So, I mean, if you're a native person, you've absolutely you know, stood next to the insignia of some racist you know, team and then had to have that moment where you're like, oh, I don't really look like that, but I know that that's what other people might think I'm supposed to look like. You know, we have to navigate these simulations of indigenous identities as part of our daily lives. And Visner calls this navigation, this understanding of how I might be perceived by a community that doesn't actually know me, um, or how I might, images about me might be circulated without my control. That navigation is called trickster hermeneutics. And it's this skill set that indigenous people end up like are end up cultivating after these different sorts of experiences of overlapping um, epistemologies. Um, so one of the ways of thinking about what Gertrude is doing in those instances is playing this sort of trickster hermeneutic. She says, "Look, I will absolutely be your token native. You can interview me and and you know make your academic fame and fortune writing a morphology of Lucenio, but I'm also going to use this opportunity strategically to pass the message on to the next generation." So that's one way of thinking about it. Another example is epistemic sovereignty. You can center epistemic sovereignty as a way of looking for glimmers of epistemic agency. Um, here we have both linguistic and epistemic sovereignty, which are very connected concepts. Um, linguistic sovereignty, as I employ the term here, refers to a given indigenous community's control over the creation, maintenance, and interrogation of the materials, um, writing, written, oral, or digital, of, or analog pertaining to their ancestral language and the ideologies and philosophies thereof. Epistemic sovereignty is that same sort of control, that, that overarching understanding of control, but with respect to knowledge systems. This is where, you know, not to get too philosophy on you, I know this is not a philosophy audience uh, necessarily, but the, the protocols, the epistemic, um, sov the, the angle about how Gertrude is negotiating, how we change ancestral protocols with respect to contemporary understandings of coercion, that's a version of, of epistemic tension around where epistemic sovereignty is the thing that's being negotiated. Again, something that could be completely missed by somebody reading an archive who doesn't attend to these particular components of caretaking. Um, another, the other two that I wanted to talk about, and again, this one is, this part is more exploratory because this is part of a much bigger project um, about archives. Um, and I'd love to hear more thoughts about this uh, from the audience in the Q&A section. But another part of the, um, of these of this toolbox around caretaking is this understanding of protocols and of safekeeping. Um, protocols, as I mentioned before, are not just a moment of, you know, of etiquette, of politeness. Um, these are connected to the way our communities our communities have ancestrally been able to maintain such enormous, not only biodiversity, but epistemic diversity in, in such a small space like Southern California. There's an enormous amount of communities who have lived there with different languages, different origin stories. And an important thing to think about the, the epistemic sovereignty of these different spaces is that one community would never think of another community's origin story as false or as incorrect. That means that there's this deep commitment to ontological pluralism in these spaces. And the protocols of knowledge exchange are part of why those are able to exist onto the future um, forever and ever because they spring from our relationships to the land. And that's really complicated and I'm happy to talk more about that later if you'd like to. But one of the things that makes me think of when I think of safekeeping and caretaking as these connected concepts is acorns. One, because I'm from California and of course I'm always thinking about acorns. Also because it's like the end of acorn season and folks back in California probably have all kinds of delicious acorns that you can send me if you want. Um, and so I think of acorns and this is why I think of acorns. So, if you go anywhere in Southern California where there's like oak groves kind of out in the mountains, you will see uh, these big boulders where you can find um, these special holes that we had been using for grinding acorns for you know hundreds and hundreds of years. It takes a long time and a lot of practice to make a hole as deep as some of these holes. Um, these spaces are just absolutely gorgeous spaces where you can feel the presence of like so many generations before you who had gathered in that space and processed acorns for their communities. Um, according to the infamous acorn lady, it takes a thousand pounds of acorns per person to make it through a whole year. 
and villages could be you know all kinds of different sizes so in the past we had collected an enormous amount of acorns and stored these acorns for very long periods of time because that's how we kept our communities healthy and nourished and fed. Thankfully, there's lots of amazing folks who are reclaiming some of these traditions. And we have new uh, acorn granaries, new um, metates and ways of, of grinding up acorns, new recipes, which are always amazing. Um, so this is not a practice of the past. This is a practice that continues. Um, but this understanding of an acorn granary as something that's connected to um, protocols of safekeeping is that understanding of storing enough acorns so that in the future other people will be able to be nourished and fed helps me kind of think of how we can conceive of an archive, an archive that we reconfigure as Indigenous people as something for safekeeping, as something that's infused with sovereignty, that's infused with um, with our ancestral protocols that's infused with this kind of patience and gentleness and understanding for our ancestors who had to make these really difficult decisions navigating um, the different changes that they had to make with respect to um, passing knowledge forward. So I have this picture here of, a, of an old acorn granary. And then here on the right, we see the inspiration of these, uh, which come from our animal relatives who you know, make these holes in the tree to save acorns for themselves as well. So it's not just a relationship between you know, humans and human knowledge. It's a, it's a deep and profound connection to our clans, to our land, to all the creatures that have taught us about how to protect ourselves and our knowledges. So yeah, that's my little epistemic toolbox. I hope that some of these are useful for you. And I'm super excited to hear if there are any questions, comments, or conversation inspired by any of this. Noshun Pilek Lovic, or thank you, my heart is good. And feel free to reach out at my email or my Twitter. Thank you so much, Shelby, for um, for sharing that beautiful, beautiful presentation. So I would like to open up the floor now for any questions that any folks might have. You're also welcome to add them to the chat if you would prefer to, um, to share them that way. I feel like there was so much to process that we might that it, it, it might be helpful to take a moment as well. Um, so as we're thinking, I can go ahead and, and get us going. Um, as you were talking, Shelby, um, I was thinking about that subtle tension between um, the desire to document for the future, which is so important for us as um, we're working to preserve our knowledges as indigenous peoples, um, but also that protection of our knowledges. It's such like a fine line and as researchers as indigenous researchers we particularly have to figure out how that works for us and how to make decisions about what we share and what we don't share and um, how to code that in our work and so i really loved your coded resistance um, in the languaging that you shared from the the gertrude story about the song um, and i've heard that story before so it was really nice to have that um, more in depth and visual representation of it. And so I guess really my question is about um, how you as a researcher yourself make decisions about what to share, what not to include, and how to be proactively protective um, of the knowledge that you're generating. That's a really great question. And it's one that I think the answer changes to kind of as I grow and change life stages. Um, I, like I mentioned in the past, been very protective and very like refusal oriented and not wanting to talk to anyone about anything or sharing anything, not only because um, I was nervous about how it might be used or weaponized against my own communities, but also because I didn't know if I had the authority to share it anyway. Um, and that becomes a really tricky thing. I've been you know, tossed in the past with, you know, doing translations or teaching language classes to young people and or even like being in a classroom and teaching indigenous studies 101 like there's these weird moments where suddenly I you know I have to make decisions about how to share things and who to share them with um and yes one of the things that has been really really helpful in that process is to have elders that I can go to and ask for um advice about different things um I have lots of folks that I consult with who are not would not call themselves elders, but are certainly, you know, esteemed in that sort of way. Um, I consult with them. I also pray on it a lot. Uh, 
that's always one of my pauses when a student asks a question that I'm not sure if I can answer. I'm like, I'll pray on it and get back to you. Um, I also had this wonderful instructor or professor in graduate school who's a black feminist epistemologist, Christy Dotson, who talks a lot about how different theorists have been able to make their work immune to extraction by attending to the implications of the implications of how um, different knowledges can be taken up as weapons. And a lot of that has to do, I think, with this caretaking process of how do you take care of the knowledge that you're sharing um, by really, really thinking about the ways it can be taken up in all of these different sorts of spaces. And for me, the best way to do that is to work in collaboration, because oftentimes I can't think of all of the ways that something might be dangerous. So I like to make sure that I'm working with a tight community of folks who, um, you know, produce what I see as very, very ethical scholarship. I think that really, thank you for that. I think that it dovetails to uh, really well with a question that Melissa Horner asks in the chat. She says, Chi Miigwech for sharing, Shelby. This was incredible. I love the poem you shared. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how it is sharing your own history, family stories embedded in your research and how this is received in academic spaces. Yes, um, that does connect to what I had just said. And it's funny because my answer kind of changes when it's inflected like that. Um, I feel a lot more comfortable sharing my own story and my own um, family processes. It would be very difficult, I think, for me to talk about you know, the shade and the uh, glimmers of resistance that you see in colonial archives um, if they weren't my family making these decisions, especially since I think some folks could think of Gertrude decision as, as a not very good decision. Um, I'm comfortable with sitting with the idea that she didn't have, you know, per, she's not a perfectly moral ancestor. She's a complicated person living in complicated conditions. Um, so I think it does, I do feel more of like an authority to acknowledge her authority um, it because she is my um, ancestor. Um, so there is a little bit more comfort there. How it's received in academic spaces is yet to be seen. I think in a, it's disciplinary. Uh, I actually was very excited that this is a multidisciplinary group of folks because it does lend itself in ways to share poetry and to share you know, things that are accessible to all kinds of different uh, learners. But I think that in, in different sorts of academic spaces, I would make different choices about how to share my family's stories because I would be nervous about how it might be weaponized because some institutions and some disciplines are connected to this very colonial excavation of knowledge. Um, and I don't feel safe invoking my ancestors in those sorts of spaces. Um, and I don't feel safe, you know, being that vulnerable. It's about boundaries with, you know, with particularly Western spaces. That's so important. And it's um, so important to think about how we create our own boundaries and our own structures to help us get through. Um, so the next question from Monty McGahey, McGahey? Um, I hope I'm saying that correctly, I'm sorry. You talked about the old style of researchers. Is there a way you recommend to cite these researchers who weren't always ethical in their research or ethical in how they referred to indigenous people in their documents? That's a good question. That's a really good question. And there are a lot of people I admire who will answer that in totally different ways. And it really does depend kind of in what venue it is that you're using this knowledge. I think there's something very powerful, even if it's um, academically frowned upon, to be very creative in the way that you cite folks. Um, sometimes if I have you know, if somebody I know and respect has done a lot of engagement with a particular archive um, such that I don't have to cite that original archive, I can cite the person who's done all this work, you know, taking back and reclaiming what's in that archive. That's one strategy is to cite the folks who are pulling from that. Another strategy that I actually got away with in my dissertation, and they can't take it back now because it's been, what, three years, um, is I actually at one point cited something quite awful that has literally been uh, in lawsuits because of how awful and um, what a violation of epistemic sovereignty this particular piece is, um, that I had said something about the piece and then in the footnote had said, take my word for it, um, and it got through. But I don't know if that works in all kinds of other spaces. Um, it really depends on the particular venue. But yes, thinking of those creative strategies to kind of subvert this really extractive um, and and colonial understanding of access that's embedded into like academic publications um, is a really important project, I think, for indigenous academics and allies thereof to kind of brainstorm around how to make our publishing processes more equitable. 
Thank you for that. That was really helpful. And we're getting some wonderful comments too. Thanks for sharing this beautiful presentation from Lauren Weber. And Paulina Krem said, thank you for sharing the complexities of archives and examples of coded resistance. This was a very impactful presentation. So you're getting some good praise here. Um, and Lynn Itagaki shares, thank you for your brilliant presentation, Dr. Meisner. In your course on archives, I was curious what you found surprising about students' reactions resistant or otherwise to archive theories you have been teaching? I have honestly found everything about my amazing students to be surprising. Not amazing, not surprising that they're brilliant, but that there's so many angles of interpreting and engaging with archives that I had just never even considered. Um, I think that this newest generation of, of scholars entering um, doctoral programs is just they're infused with a commitment to social justice. They're, in, they're infused with this commitment to um, understanding and engaging difference, um, such that my students come in um, like with this healthy balance of, of skepticism and of guardedness, as well as like this generative, like true joy for trying to connect and build relationships in all of these different spaces. So shout out to my amazing graduate students at Georgetown. Um, but they, uh, one of the things I have definitely found surprising as we've been working through different materials is how quick they are comfortable with incommensurability, how quick they are comfortable with like, oh, yep, well, I can't know that. That's not for me to know. Um, and I don't know if that would be shocking to other folks in other disciplines, but in philosophy, it's very shocking to come across somebody who is comfortable uh, with this kind of decolonized understanding of knowledge such that not everything is for you and not everything is up for grabs and that incommensurability, thick incommensurability is a part of our lived realities. And we can still have coalitions across that understanding of incommensurability, that generosity and generativity of, of uh, incommensurability is just amazing to me, especially in philosophical spaces. Yes, I agree very much wholeheartedly um, on so many of those factors. Thank you. And um, do we have any any additional questions that anyone would like to share? If not, we okay, good. Um, if not, we can go ahead and just wrap up. Um, if you let me go ahead and um, share the information. Thank you so much. Kelly, did you want to post the um, the link in the chat? We do have a couple of different, um, different um, programs coming up still. And so Kelly has posted the link to the schedule in the chat. We have um, November 16th at 7 p.m. at the at the Hit Street Ragtag Cinema. We have Four Directions and the Ragtag Film Society have partnered for the Show Me series on Indigenous short films. And so that will be a, a short film series with five Indigenous short films and a panel discussion. So please do go ahead and join that. And then on November 17th at 6.15 in the Lester Bryant Auditorium in the Medical School, um, room M105, um, and there's also a virtual link. We have Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, Chuck Hoskin Jr. So yay, our chief will be here. Um, and then I think that is the end of our programming for the month, but we're so grateful to have you all here and, and thank you so much for joining us at noon on a Friday. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and keep the Zoom link open in case anyone wants to say hello or um, check in with Shelby for anything, but otherwise, um, I hope to see you all at our future events. Have a good day and thank you so much.